everyone welcome back um technical difficulties are hopefully fixed we'll find out real quick uh but thank you all for your patience uh what a strange issue i blame discord because i always blame discord and it deserves it uh but let's just make sure these are all resolved and then we will uh start this all back up so uh max once more with feeling uh just a couple words uh to make sure that you are audible without an enormous delay all right um gonna introduce myself for a third time i'm max bellomio i'm an animator and paleo artist who's been directing a documentary film for a few years now oh you can hear me awesome okay praise yeah <laughs> <laughs> thank God, great. um, great. That lets us move forward uh, much better. We love Discord, we promise. But thank you all for your patience for this. Um, so yes, we are joined uh, by Max Bellamio, and we'll be talking about Forgotten Bloodlines I get quite a bit more a little bit later in the stream. Uh, I'm super excited. Uh, this, this is going to be fun now that the tech issues are sorted. Um, but here's the thing, chat. While many of you, I can see, are paleo people, um, I am not. I am a paleo person by uh, general osmosis, and so I have brought the person for whom who is responsible for the osmosis uh, on to join us. Uh, Alicia, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, chat. Uh, I'm Alicia. I am also uh, Ludo History's elder sibling. Yep. Um, I am. Uh, have an undergrad degree in paleontology, a master's in education, and have been obsessed with paleontology since as soon as I could talk, according to our parents. Um, um, certainly for so... us, from as soon as I can remember, because there's a reason why one of the first films I can remember seeing is Walking with Dinosaurs, and it, the reason is you. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so I'm very excited to uh, have had Adam invite me to uh, join in this as well. Always super interested in the state of paleo reconstruction, paleo media in general, um, and super excited to hear more about the Forgotten Bloodlines project and chat through sort of the process of creating a documentary like this. Awesome. I am super duper excited. It's going to be a great time. Um, so here's the plan, chat. We are going to start off by just generally doing a little bit of a discussion around the current state of uh, paleo media, because it's a little bit rough. I won't lie. Uh, y'all have been y'all have been starved for content, and I feel for you. Um, and then we're going to run the trailer for uh, Forgotten Bloodlines. I get and be able to talk more specifically about that project, uh, the and the Miocene and uh, the agate fossil beds out near Harrison, Nebraska. As Raptornis just helpfully dropped in chat, this project is currently in Kickstarter, so if you like your he what you're hearing and like this sort of conversation, uh, definitely go check that out. Uh, Raptornis will be dropping links throughout, uh, and it is pinned there, to go check out the Kickstarter uh, in order to be able to create a full pilot episode and pitch this to studios and turn this into a full-fledged paleo documentary. Uh, it's a super worthwhile project, uh, and one we I highly encourage you to check out if you like this. All right, so let's get into it. Um, first things first, uh, we've already mentioned it, but like realistically, where do you guys think um, the like modern idea of like paleo media comes from? Like certainly, like there's been obsession with paleo stuff since you know the what. Uh, Mary Anning, uh, and the Bone Wars of the, like, late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, so, you know, uh, there's been obsession since as soon as people properly identified dinosaurs, uh, as a thing, and, um, attempted reconstructions. Not well, but they sure tried. Uh, but it does feel like the, kind of, in the, I guess, to me, the 19, like, very late 1980s or 1990s that something changes um so i'd be curious to get your thoughts as like the history of what we're working with here 
uh, with the Paleo documentary. Yeah, so a big motivation for starting uh, this Paleo documentary was because, as you mentioned, people love this sort of thing. Everyone's always been fascinated by it. But in the past, like, even 20 years, there hasn't been a lot. Like, the biggest uh, Paleo documentary, Walking with Dinosaurs, uh, some people argue that still hasn't been topped in terms of believability and... Um, naturalism in the animals and while there certainly have been you no know, i love walking with beasts that's my favorite out of the i guess the three big ones but i think once paleo documentaries started becoming a thing because before the 90s that wasn't as much of a thing that existed you know it was mainly in blockbuster movies where you'd you'd see them um, uh, like in, in King Kong, that's where, that's the sort of thing you'd see dinosaurs in. And so there was a bit of a renaissance, a bit of resurgence, in my opinion, around the late 80s, early 90s, where uh, dinosaurs and prehistory was brought back into pop culture and people realized, oh, these are real animals that existed. These are more than just fantasy. And I think we are in a similar age right now where prehistoric planet has become kind of the walking with dinosaurs for the new generation where everyone is used to seeing the Jurassic World movies and that sort of thing where prehistory is monsterfied and mystified and now they start to see prehistoric animals as real creatures and that's something that has been I've seen a lot of fascination for and something I want to recapture that for is something not related to dinosaurs because deep time that's like life has been on earth for you know half a billion years and most of that still goes overlooked and there has been a lull in paleo media in general and i think the definition of paleo media has become so broad to include anything that resembles prehistoric life or prehistoric environments because everyone is starved to see that in their mainstream media outside of just books and art pieces. Yeah. Sorry, I, I went on a tangent there. Don't worry about it. Uh, that is totally fine. But yeah, right, I, I suspect the technological change that uh, helps spur that is the birth of, like, believable CGI. Uh, yeah. Because there's definitely, I don't know, uh, Gosh, what is it? Is it, like, the 1960s Clash of the Titans that has, like, a... What... The dragon is just a really crappy, um... Sauropod? I remember there's, yeah, so, like, there's something that has, like, that stop-motion animated sauropod that's some sort yeah. of, like, myth adaptation, and it's funny. It's extremely funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are yeah. definitely some, some old movies that they were... They were trying, um, and I know for yeah. those of you that are familiar with the 1999 um, Walking with Dinosaurs or the smaller documentary uh, they made about Big Al, which is a Montana find, yeah. um, there's a lot of... I might be a, have been slightly too obsessed with those DVDs when I was a child. In the extended features, they talk a lot about the process that they used. Um, and that particular uh, documentary was an innovator in uh, creating basically brand new technology, working with paleo artists, um, but also modern biologists, actually building within 3D computer models uh, how those creatures would move, how they'd actually articulate. And that did a ton for the field of paleo art reconstruction that um, had never been done before and actually changed how museum mounting was done after that because they realized Ooh. the way that we were articulating like hips and tails wasn't making animals that could have actually stood up properly. <laughs> um, so you'll see a shift after that. Um, we started being able to run these computer simulations of how these creatures might have actually moved. Uh, in that we realized a lot of our, our museum mounts were just wrong. That musculature couldn't work in the way that we thought it would when, well, you can just put the bones together however you like. We, you sure can. Um, chat, 
as an example of putting the bones together however you like. <laughs> you, you can do truly, agreed truly to... anything. <laughs> Yeah. They're egregious examples of this. Uh, th this guy is apparently a woolly rhinoceros uh, from Magdeburg. Um, apparently. Uh, I love the, I don't know if you have it available, but the uh, Iguanodon with the thumb spike on his nose is a personal favorite as well. Uh, do you know what museum that's in? I can definitely find it. I don't remember. There might be a Charles Knight. Uh painting where they reconstructed it that way but charles knight gets a pass of being an artist who was uh painting in the 1890s so. yeah and i think his art was still i got very it believable. like even if yeah like even if scientifically inaccurate by our modern standards he still understood animal anatomy so his old dinosaur art still looks like real things that could have existed even if they're completely different from how we know they look now. Look at this little guy with his little thumb nose. <laughs> it, it's definitely leaning on the iguana side of iguana. Yeah, yeah it is. Uh, this, also, isn't this like um, a fraction? It looks like it's like clinging onto a branch here, and that's um, one big branch. Be very... <laughs> Admittedly, the way it's drawn, it kind of looks like a second spinal column, but that's neither here nor there. That's true. Yeah. Uh, no, so... I never questioned that Watson branch. It is weird. Yeah, uh, very much a guan and not so much Don right there. <laughs> uh, uh, but you can see, even in the way that he's drawn that, all of those dotted lines, he's supposing what those bones might have been yeah so the only ones that they actually found are the ones that are sort of shaded in there and that was a i mean it's still a common problem you know we are often making reconstructions of any sort of prehistoric creature based on whatever fragmentary fossil evidence we find and so that's something that leads to a lot of creativity but also can lead to a lot of looking back later once we've found more fossils uh, and going, well, that wasn't quite right, now was it? <laughs> not, not, yeah. not quite. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> I love that one so I much. I love that one so much. It's, <laughs> it, it just, it, the jokes write themselves. <laughs> it's trying its best. <laughs> it's yeah. so good. Uh, but, uh, Alicia, you talked, right, about the Allosaurus walking with dinosaur special, like, really being an investment in like in the field i know that's something that also there's another awfully big budget uh show that often get or movie that often gets credited with uh having a similar impact about eight years earlier and that's jurassic park you're gonna make me talk about jurassic park on stream yes i'm gonna make you talk about jurassic park on stream this is no. a pale paleo media <laughs> it is one of the two genres <laughs> all right yeah. well Full disclosure, I've never seen Jurassic Park. You've I have never, never seen, seen any of the Jurassic Park movies. You are the movies. only oh, paleo man. person. <laughs> that, that's wild. That's wild. So, I obviously, I have seen screenshots. I am very aware of both some of the things that they did um, that were really cool about that, and obviously some of the misconceptions and problems that came from Jurassic Park. Uh, but I cannot talk too much to the details of the movie, for I have never seen it. <laughs> Yeah, I can talk about Jurassic Park all day, but that's not what this stream is about. But so we can talk about it a little bit. Uh, yeah. Let's have a, a little bit of Jurassic Park as a treat. <laughs> uh, yeah. But right, but it is obviously super important because uh, while being based on a book that I know you have read because you gave me your copy of it, um, is... Uh, right... There's a lot of invention and fiction attached to it kind of inherently, but in terms of, like, realizing that CG could be used to create, like, believable dinosaurs, I think is wildly important. But at the same time, uh, you know, it is action with, like, light horror, so dinosaurs are very much not... 
not things to be appreciated. Oh, right. Well, they're not the bad guys in that movie by any metric. Yeah. They are the uh, scary things that are going to eat you. And yeah, that's I, I do halfway think, there. I do think the movie has. I do think it has a good balance of admiration for the animals, and a way I like to read Jurassic Park are the dinosaurs are more of of a metaphor for you know human greed and hubris. Like I'm sure you've heard that before. Um, but I definitely think media that came after this didn't really understand the nuances of what they're trying to get at with the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, and then later movies do turn into just the scary things that are trying to eat the people. Yeah. And that's something that I really... that I really miss about the first movie, because while the animals are scary and they are threatening, they're threatening in the same way like a lion or a tiger would be. You wouldn't want a tiger to break out of its enclosure right next to you, but... They're, they're more monsterified in later installments. Yeah, and I think that is something that, um, you know, anyone dealing with dinosaurs has to look back on and realize Jurassic Park was exaggerating a bit for effect. It wasn't trying to depict dinosaurs how they were. Exactly. But because someone mentioned how it has a huge shadow over paleo content where... This is kind of the go-to where everyone, when most people think of a dinosaur, they think of Jurassic Park. They don't realize that these are stylized dinosaurs, exaggerated for cinematic effect. They think, oh, this is just what a T-Rex was. Yeah. But then they put a T-Rex in their own media and they exaggerate it further and it just becomes further and further from the real animal. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. And I do like, for all that I will a little bit rag on it and have not uh, personally seen the movies, I think especially the first film, um, both on a technical level and on a level of how they are trying to portray the dinosaurs, you're exactly oh, right. It's like those wild animals. They're wild animals in a zoo and they got out and they're going to yeah. do what they're going to do. Um, I think it is then the effects of, well, people think Velociraptor is what is actually a Utah Raptor, and people get all, they get these ideas in their head of this is based entirely on the modern science, and A, the film is from 1993, so it is 30 years old at this point, True. the state of the field has changed, and yeah. it was always meant to be this fictionalized portrayal of it. Um, but, I mean, they were doing really cool stuff with CGI. They were doing really cool stuff with the puppetry, because in yeah, like, the first Jurassic Park, they have yeah. physical props as well. Yeah, and without Jurassic Park, Walk with Dinosaurs would not have happened. So it is a bit of a, a double-edged sword if you, if people in the chat aren't Jurassic Park fans. Your favorite paleo media only exists because Jurassic Park proved that it's possible with computers and that it's profitable. Yeah. And that's something that I, I think the influence it has is greatly overlooked. Like, even though people understand that it's very impactful, I don't think people realize just how impactful it was. Yeah, I, I have nothing but, you know, uh, respect and, like, understanding of the fictionalization of the first one. Well, yeah. How I feel about the sixth one now is oh, a different oh, matter. Oh, so, yeah. uh, chat, chat was noting that we were calling out Jurassic World. Yeah, and that no, is just... okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, I think we can without the movie is not out yet, and so we'll, you know, judgments can't super be made. But also, we're going to make the judgments anyway. The upcoming film sixty five. Um, I don't think. I don't think it's going to surprise us with uh, the nuanced I'm, depictions of dinosaurs over here. <laughs> I've, I've read some of the first reviews. It, it's not good. It's not looking good. Who could have predicted? I, yeah. <laughs> uh, by the way, I am curious. Is this a like, reasonable, more modern reconstruction? I see they've got the feather nubs. Yeah, uh, that's, but that, that's that, more reasonable. That, yeah. The hand looks spooky to me. Um, yeah, but well, what's funny expert. is... Yeah, what's funny is when you Google the T-Rex paleo art, one of my pieces is, like, on the top of the page. hey oh, uh, <laughs> Yeah. To, I... And I'm biased, but I prefer that one. <laughs> but, Shocker. yeah, this, this is a more modern reconstruction of it. This was before um, 
Gabriel Ugueto, he's a really good artist, but this was before he got like really good, so I do think the hand looks a bit flat there. Uh -huh. um, yeah, but this is closer to... It, it you certainly know, gives you enough to see just like how radically the difference is um, between... And it's... It's not even a, a time thing. Um, like, in the 90s, reconstructions of T-Rex, like, apart from some soft tissue differences and, and feathers, looked pretty similar to how they do now. And the Jurassic Park one was already stylized based off 90s reconstructions. Yeah. Uh, de definitely leans into uh, much more of, like, the scaliness of modern reptiles and then the big, heavy crest like eyebrow yeah. crests to make it more spooky yeah it's i mean it's super successful at what it's trying to be uh but even i've seen a lot of that of every museum exhibit uh mentions jurassic park at some yeah. point uh yeah. every piece of paleo media of like the modern age uh meant owes something to jurassic park and yeah, in a lot and, of ways, think... right, there's either the copycat or the counter the response to, and, like, this yeah, and to I me is the starting problem point. That, and I think it's a problem that it's 30 years old by this point, but Jurassic Park is still the most well-known and, and most beloved, um, like, movie or piece of media at all that features dinosaurs. And I think it's it's a bit upsetting that you know, people have been born and lived entire lives in, in this span of time, and there hasn't been any other dinosaur media that has shown up that kind of takes the center stage. Everything is always comparing to this 30-year-old movie. Yeah. Um, I, I agree. And on that note, I actually want to turn to a slightly different topic, because part of, I think, the reason why is that Jurassic Park proved that dinosaurs are profitable. Yeah. And that's about it. Uh, I've got up here uh, the most helpful Geologic Society of America uh, geologic timescale with all of the names. So many names. So many things that you, I am not going to try too much to pronounce. Um, but, you know, going back 400 or what is that? 4,000 million years ago. So uh, to the Hadean period at 4 billion years old. Uh, all the way through to the present, uh, the entire deep time of Earth, and realistically, right, the Mesozoic column gets all of the love. Honestly, just the Jurassic and Cretaceous out of that, too. Even That's Triassic fair. tends yeah. to be fairly neglected. We care about our Stegosaurs and our T-Rexes and our Triceratops and our sauropods, and, yeah, and I think, yeah. that's it. <laughs> and those Maybe animals a are very, yeah, those animals are very charismatic, but I think because they're so well known, I feel like people aren't willing to take risks in researching and including less well known species in their their media. Exactly. Um. Right. And but you see this even in like super high budget natural history museum exhibits. Um, I want to see if I can find it. I should pull this up earlier, but I always think of like field museums, uh, big, uh, evolutionary history galleries. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, and I think it's a self-fulfilling prophecy where museums show the dinosaurs people are familiar with because it helps get people interested, but then those are the only things they're familiar with. So it's hard to introduce, um, something new if you're always trying to appeal to what people know if you're trying if you know what i'm saying yeah uh dang i did, they don't have a map easily available of the gallery but uh i wanted to show it because i think it's super illustrative basically chat what it does is it's two hallways with a room at the end and so you get a hallway that goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and then the room at the end is all dinosaurs then you get a hall that goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and then you're done uh and so you get you know cambrian explosion because we all love our weird little boys um we get the big bugs of the carboniferous we get dinosaurs uh we get woolly mammoths we get giant terrifying pigs and then you're done I just uh, dropped the, it's a little bit outdated, but the Evolving Planet Gallery map. Thank you. Uh, let's click over there.
can actually see it. Uh, there it is. Look at it. Uh, it <laughs> yeah. illustrates the problem perfectly. Look at that. Yeah. Precambrian are weird little boys. Uh, big bugs. Dinosaurs. All the dinosaurs. There's a woolly mammoth yeah. over here, and then you're done. Yeah, I do think it's also partially because dinosaur skeletons are just so big, and it takes up more room, but yeah, I agree. It's definitely the problem where let's put all the attention into this, and the rest of it is kind of irrelevant. Well, and some of it is certainly the size, but I would argue the yeah. same is true of any of the megafauna from any yeah. Oh, yeah. portion yeah. of the... That's the true, tertiary yeah. and quaternary, and so, but you could see even on this, the Jurassic and Cretaceous section is still bigger than the combined yeah, no, it, everything it's... in the Cenozoic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No way they have like woolly mammoths in there, and it's a space thing. They're definitely prioritizing the Jurassic and Cretaceous for display. Yeah, um, it's what audiences want, right? It's what audiences have wanted for a yeah. very long time, and they're. You gotta do it, and you gotta get uh, you gotta get Sue uh, right in the center over here, because now they've got what a, a huge sauropod in the uh, like main hall. Oh yeah, I haven't seen it since they've updated the uh, field museum exhibits, but yeah, I think you're right. I think they've moved a sauropod to the central hall and moved Sue up, and they still have the mounts done in a way that I don't fully agree with. Um, <laughs> of course they, they mount the rib cages way too wide, but... Oh, yeah. Yep. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this illustrates it just the everything we were talking about so perfectly of... And just think, right, this is like the modern standard uh, uh, like, the classic European, uh, Victorian natural history museums are way worse for this. Uh. Oh, yeah. Evolving Planet is in many ways a very innovative earth science yeah. exhibit. Yeah. Uh, like, this is, this is probably one of the best. Uh, and yet you still see this huge bias towards, you know, the Jurassic Sea Beasts off in the corner here, uh, your big raptors with your Jurassic Park reference saying, hey, this isn't a Metrodon, not a Velociraptor. There's some Velociraptors over here. You got Sue. Uh, and then you've got a, one mammoth and like a giant sloth over here, and that's it. How does the bone hole in the Smithsonian stay out? That's the other good one, right? I haven't actually, the last time I went to the Smithsonian, I wasn't actually able to see it because Oof. they were renovating it. So I, I haven't seen the updated one yet. Uh, but I'm I, really disappointed by I, that. I, I've seen, I was doing some looking at like digital stuff in museums, and the Bone Hall mm -hmm. seems to do some really stu fun stuff with like uh, AR yeah. apps to do computer generated animation of the, yeah. uh, the mounted skeletons. And that's super cool. I think that's super prom a promising use of CG. But yeah, I haven't been to the physical gallery in a very long time. It's going to yeah. be like 15 years at this point since I've actually Jesus. been over to the Smithsonian. Uh, I wonder yeah, if they've got I... maps of it. Uh... I've just found it. Yeah, I'll drop it. Although I think this is of the whole uh, Natural History Museum. Uh, rather than just the fossil gallery at this point. Um, but there's that, and then this is the Bone Hall website itself. Oh, I need to make sure that opens in browser. Please hold while uh, my default computer settings uh, <laughs> screw me, ruin my stream day. <laughs> uh, open with Firefox. Let's try that again. Uh... And I don't know when exactly they did this update. I do wonder if uh, Dr. Johnson was part of this. Probably. This I looks like think so. <laughs> the, this, this does feel an awful lot like his work, doesn't it? Uh, but yeah, like the Skin and Bones app is actually super cool. Uh, they've got a bunch of stuff in the Bone Hall specifically uh, that on their, like, prehistoric reconstructions that do some really fun CG work. Do they have anything on that actually showcases this helpfully? 
Uh, there's the location map at the top. I don't know if that does, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah. The video doesn't show too much. Oh, it's just the same one. It's just this one again, yeah. So yeah, the video unfortunately doesn't show a whole lot of what they're doing, but there is a lot to do. And by the way, thank you for the anonymous gifter who's gifted uh, two gift subs during this stream to Fanglicam and to Geo Anomaly. <laughs> Uh, all right. Uh, but yeah, sadly, they don't really, they don't really show, uh, exactly how their deep time is laid out, much less how their fossil lab is. Uh, but I definitely am curious to see the ways in which they follow and or buck these trends. I think that's potentially super interesting. Uh, and I know there's, uh, work at like the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and a mm -hmm. few others that I'm familiar with uh, that are planning renovations to their fossil halls. And so I think in the next probably five to 10 years, we will see a lot of these more established museums recognize the need to really update uh, in part because many of these exhibits haven't been updated in 50 years and there's just been a lot of change. Um, but also recognize that there is such a heavy focus often on dinosaurs and start to expand, although I think just because of what the public tends to be interested in, we will still have a little bit of this Mesozoic bias, which means that's what people are interested in. And so we get the Mesozoic bias and that's where I think sort of projects um, like Forgotten Blood Lions Agate give us an opportunity to maybe start to buck that trend and tap into some of these periods of time that are still incredibly interesting, um, but that maybe don't get as much attention because they're not dinosaurs. Exactly. Yeah. So if you take one thing from this chat, it is end Mesozoic supremacy. The time of the dinosaurs is over. The time <laughs> of weird pigs is now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on that note, I think it's time to roll the trailer for Forgotten Bloodlines I get and uh, get into a, a more detailed discussion of the project uh, and the process of creating a paleo documentary. So uh, awesome. please hold while uh, we're going to uh, briefly roll uh, the Kickstarter trailer for Forgotten Bloodlines Oh, I don't think the sound is working for it. Seen epoch. Although seemingly familiar, this is a world of wonder, mystery, and danger. <laughs> From tiny rhinos the size of dogs to bizarre horse-like giants, with claws instead of hooves, and a pig-like behemoth with jaws that could crush bone. A world forgotten to time, never seen by the eyes of man, until now. This is the incredible story of two of America's most astounding bygone beasts. into an ancient world, Forgotten Bloodlines Agate. Please support us on Kickstarter, now live. All right. Uh, I am super excited uh, about this. And, like, this is such a cool time period. Uh, let's click over into this one. For anyone who's curious, we are uh, roughly 20 million years ago. Uh in Forgotten Bloodlines, so as we zoom in on our paleo map, we're looking right here in the early stages of the Miocene epic. Uh, so, uh, firstly, Max, I suppose I want to start off with just, like, what is, to you, I suppose, the coolest thing that makes you want to work in the Miocene? So, what I really love about the Miocene is it's a bit of... It's the point in Earth's history where we start to see the modern groups of animals we're familiar with pop up, like camels, rhinos, elephants, uh, horses. That's when 
they start to become recognizable. But there's also some I, lineages that were still around from earlier that eventually died off at that time. So you have horse ancestors living with um, weird entelodons, which are related to hippos and their and lineage, which is completely gone. Same thing with the the bear dogs, the uh, amphicion. I, I can't say <laughs> amphicionids. Those these predators, these animals that. Oh, and oreodonts. I can't forget about those. I love oreodonts because they are a subset of. They branched off from modern ungulates, uh, pretty early on, and they're completely gone now. And what I like about the Maya scene is you have these animals that are kind of like what exists today, but kind of not. And I think that is something really interesting to explore. Yeah. Uh, I need to pull up images of some of these weird boys, because uh, they're... Uh, is that spelled cor correctly in chat for Amphicion? Uh, yeah, am am Amphicion, Amphicion, yeah. However, how? However, it yeah. works. Aw, it's yeah. cute. Oh, yeah. I want to pet it. We don't see that in the documentary, but um, the Amphicionids, that's the, the proper term for bear dogs, and the one we do feature is Daphinodon. Aw, it's so cute. Yeah. What a good boy. And, and, <laughs> yeah, and these are, are equally related. They're related to dogs and cats, but they, they look like bears mixed with dogs. That's why they're called that. But yeah. They're, they're completely gone now, and it's interesting seeing kind of, I guess, nature experimenting with forms that would eventually become successful and would eventually become the type of animals we're, we're familiar with. Uh, amazing. Uh, but yeah, w let's uh, talk then more about the specific site that you're working with, because you are basing this documentary, from what I understand, off of a specific national monument. Uh, do you want to go yes. into detail as to the setting of, uh, or the more specific rather than just, you know, the Miocene, which is a l several yeah. several million years, uh, yeah. about, what, tw almost 20 million years uh, over the entire world. Where specifically uh, is Forgotten Bloodlines set? So Forgotten Bloodlines, as the name uh, suggests, it's based in the Agate Fossil Beds National Monument. Uh, specifically, we're, we're looking at the Lower Harrison Beds, uh, which is a, a quarry in the National Mar Monument where loads and loads of mammal bones have been found in huge numbers, and they reveal this entire ecosystem. And what we loved about um, this location was because it was such a fully realized environment uh, because of uh, this valley that um, everything used to live in, it was filled with uh, ephemeral water holes that would bring uh, huge herds of wildlife together during periods of drought and they would eventually die to dehydration and exposure and that's why you find so many mammal bones in this one location. And this was a time where the North America used to be more forested. Um, the environment was oak savannas still exist, but in very small uh, patches in the north, in the Midwest. Um, but imagine African savannas, but with oak trees and walnuts and other uh, North American plants we're familiar with that once dominated this landscape before increasing aridity and as the first ice ages started approaching a few million years later, um, it became drier. That's where the first grasslands started to appear. And what we're focusing on here in the beginning of the Miocene was a subtropical environment that had both grassy plains and wooded savannas that allowed um, kind of ancestors of pronghorn ancestors of camels, ancestors of horses, living with animals that were adapted to this almost subtropical environment, like the calcathirs, the entelodonts, the oreodonts. And that's what I find interesting. It was a bit like 
the African Serengeti, but in North America with animals that originated in North America. Yeah. And that's why we chose this, this location. Amazing, yeah. Uh, just looking at the National uh, the National Park Service page here, I can see, right, there's just a lot of, looks like a lot of trends of, looks like both, I guess what we would now consider plains uh, climate zones yeah. and the Great Basin into, like, the foothills of the Rockies, all sort of mixing here. Because uh, for anyone who doesn't know, the agate uh, fossil beds are just south of Harrison, Nebraska, which is only about, like, what, 30, 40 miles from the Colorado border. So we're looking at extreme western uh, Nebraska right as we're getting into uh, or coming up on the edge of what's now the Great Plains. So, like, this period where, or this climate zone, where there's just a lot of stuff happening in the almost smack dab center of the United States. Yeah. Yeah, and it's... And another reason this location was so, I, I don't know the word, I guess, successful was because to the west of uh, volcanic activity, and that's also why it's called Agate National Monument, because of the rocks found, uh, the agate rocks, which are vo volcanic. You know what? I should let the um, the geoscientists talk about this part. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm rapidly trying to pull up geologic maps. Uh, the geology of Nebraska during the Miocene is not my expertise, but um, yeah, let me pull up a geologic map real quick of that area. Amazing. So when, when we get that, we'll take a look in more detail at the uh, geology of the region, which I think is pretty obviously super important to understanding. Uh, I think successful is an interesting word, but I think it's the, a good word for this, uh, in that we've got a lot of populations that are interacting. And right for a paleo documentary, uh, especially one where I can feel the influence coming off of uh, you know the big ones, your prehistoric planets, your walking with dinosaurs, yeah. but for the Miocene. Uh, I think that yeah. enables a lot of super cool, like, storylines and narratives. Yeah, it, it allows us up. to, like, the, the big takeaway from the geology is we know that the soil was very rich with nutrients that would allow a bit of a hub for animals from all over to, to come to. And, yeah, that definitely allows for a lot of story opportunities. And that's part of the reason why I think um, the Paleozoic hasn't gotten as much attention because in storytelling mediums, it's hard to get something like um, like uh, an Opabinia from the Cambrian and try to tell a character-based story with that like you can with like a, a herd of mammals. So yeah. <laughs> that was also a, a huge reason why we liked Agate as a first location because there is a lot of diversity where we can kind of show what the Miocene is all about and we yeah, can tell a story. Yeah, it's it's definitely the the Harrison formation is definitely one of the better ones in that yeah. area. Um, you know, there's of course yeah. the great dinosaur one is the Morrison formation, um, mm -hmm. but then the Harrison formation has a lot. Um, I'm not finding a good geologic map, unfortunately, because oh. of course most so of have, the Western interior is uh, I pure shale. I uh, one of the papers <laughs> well, that we use for it. Uh, there's, I think there's a geologic map in this. Okay, okay. that would be great. If you, if you have it, uh, that would be awesome. But uh, you're telling me that Anomalcaris isn't like the perfect protagonist for your narrative stories. Look up yeah. Ophibena though. <laughs> Ophibena is really cool. Uh, you will have to well, spell one, that one for one me. One of the writers for Agate, we, we learned this this the hard way. Um, he tried to write a story, like a 15 minute story about Pikaia, and how do you do? He couldn't do it. It was yeah. impossible to write that story. Uh, and some of that is just an unfortunate feature of the fossil record. The Miocene is nice in that at only 20... Uh, oh, that's not bringing up the right stuff. Those are... That's not that's not pulling up any of the right things. Uh, that's pulling All up right. Yu-Gi-Oh cards, first and foremost, <laughs> uh, and not Cambrian fossils. Uh, that's fine. Well, I'll find it. I think I spelled it wrong. Yeah. Um, I've 
linked uh, the PDF to where a lot of our information comes from. And if you scroll down to about page 30, there's a geologic map and yeah. Beautiful. Uh, then let me open this up in the correct spot. Once again, I have gotten baited by uh, my auto open. And so we'll just pull that up here on browser oh, and yeah, we'll the, zoom um, way down. Yeah, that thing we can for, yeah, so I don't watch anime, but I saw that, like, the, the Naruto opening, for a split second, you see anomaly cars show up for absolutely no reason, and I love that. We love them. We love our <laughs> weird shrimp boy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, like I was saying, a lot of the larger scale geologic maps of Nebraska uh, just show shale because uh, it's all underwater for a significant portion of time. But yeah, this is o Opabina. Uh, it has oh, five okay. eyes. Why? Oh, good this... I don't know. That's yeah. just how the Cambrian worked. <laughs> oh, wait, my apologies. I'm scrolling through it now, and this is the wrong paper. I don't see a geologic map of Nebraska here. Uh Look at how Oops. good this boy is. Oh, wait, is. no, no, there is, there is, yeah, there is. I've Sorry, got, page, I've 45, got... page 45, page 35. 35, we can get a more detailed one? Uh, perfect. Yeah. Uh... Somewhere. It's probably there it is. one. There <laughs> it is. It's almost on screen. There it is. Uh, yeah. what does that actually mean? Um, uh, looks like a lot of... It looks like it's mostly just like various shale formations uh, in the region, which with, makes sense. With a big old alluvial bed that runs right through the center. Yep. Yep. That that looks like it's. I mean, it's basically the Niobara, uh, right? Still runs through the region, uh, and does much the same thing in the present day as what this ancient one did. So yeah. Uh. That is helpful. Awesome. People are very helpfully providing even more options, but I think this will cover us uh, well enough for this. Basically, right, I think that says everything important, that there is this big river that runs through that creates this beautiful alluvial plain that everyone gathers to. And that's good for making putting a lot of uh, weird beasts in close contact with each yeah. other, which is good news. Uh, yeah. Sadly, none uh, of these cuties. Really, yeah. He's got the little mouth. I've seen really looking forward to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let, let's turn back to the Miocene instead of the, the Cambrian weird guys. Um, yeah, what what are some of the scenes and characters we can expect to see um, in Forgotten Bloodlines Agate? So, I guess the two, you could call them characters, but we don't name them to avoid anthropomorphizing the animals. But... There is an A plot and a B plot. First one follows uh, a Deodon, uh, showing uh, him growing from a subadult to a full-grown adult with who had amassed a territory, and we want to show uh, the story of uh, how this this bull uh, kind of gained power in his in his region, and the eventual downfall of. Intelligence as a whole, which we're using this character as as a metaphor for. Um, second uh, story would follow uh, Meropis, follows a full a baby Meropis who gets separated from her mother at a young age, and we see this Meropis growing up and starting a herd. And uh, through all that, we show the different behaviors of these Calicathiers, and we speculate on herding behavior. Because these these animals, uh, there is sexual dimorphism with uh, Meropis. Uh, if you could pull up the images, the skulls that I have shared. Yeah, um, we'll give me just a sec yeah. to relocate them. Uh, there's one. Yeah. There's one of them. Uh, where's the other one? Is that this this guy? Yeah. So this is one the, is. Is it these two that you want? Yeah, so this one um, from the Smithsonian Museum, this one is likely, oh, I, I don't actually know which museum this one's from, but the other one's from the Smithsonian. This one's likely a female Meropis. You can see the longer snout with the larger eyes. If you go back to the Smithsonian Museum mount, you'll see it has a bit of a stockier skull. And this one is reconstructed, but it is based on uh, full skulls. 
like this, where the snout's a bit shorter. And what's interesting is these uh, morphs of Meropis are found in association with each other, leading us to speculate that they live in bachelor herds and bachelorette herds, kind of similar to how uh, modern zebra do, where they split off from the herd, they form one of their own sex, and that's how they intermingle. So we show the story of our main Meropis character through that lens and her different interactions with the herds she meets along the way. And I don't want to spoil too much about the story because I think, you know, we, we do want to place a lot of focus on scientific accuracy, mm -hmm. but we're also trying to tell the, a story with characters and showing them learn and grow. And we, we there's payoffs to their actions, which I don't want to specify because that gets into spoiler territory. If you if you want to learn the payoff, go over to the Kickstarter page and help fund yeah. the project so that you can learn it, we can all learn it together. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We also uh, looks like certainly framed in the context of the trailer, we've got uh, this weird pig looking guy uh, as yeah, yeah, one of our yeah. one of our potential quote unquote villains. As far as there is a villain in a paleo so documentary. This this actually, this is the protagonist. This is one Amazing. of the protagonists. Yeah. And we we see him. So there is, I guess, an antagonist one uh, in the trailer. That's the one with the um, the blind eye and the scars all over yeah. his face. That's the, the older bull who challenges this one when he's trying to find a mate. And as as the Miocene approaches, so right now, dead on, they're doing fine, but because we're trying to tell a larger story kind of implying um, deeper time, uh, the story of this guy would mostly be struggle in to survive in an environment where there aren't very many of him. Um, and he struggles to find a mate, and that's kind of where this, I guess, antagonist character comes in. Yeah. I, I say character with quotes because they're animals. Yeah. And we aren't trying to anthropomorphize them. But in the glorious tradition set many years ago, certainly, you know, by planet Earth, uh, if by no one else, giving good storylines to animals is the most important thing you can do. Yeah. And we... we spread it out. So the original idea for this was going to be a film, but because we ended up needing to turn to Kickstarter to fund this, we split it into three parts. Yeah. And it already was split into three acts to begin with, so it was pretty easy to do that, and the flow of the story is exactly the same. But there are long periods where we just see the animals in their natural environment just doing what they do, going about their day. There's a whole section with this day on where we simply see him walking through the forest and eating berries, and we talk about how in times of drought, they would, there's evidence of their teeth microware where they would eat berries mm -hmm. to supplement water for themselves. So we have uh, large periods where we take a break from the story just to show interesting behaviors of these animals. And if you could pull it up right now, the pictures of the caching um these are the big piles of bones that uh, there's evidence in archaeotherium a relative of daedon that came a bit early in the elite and the elite it's hard to say oligocene that there's evidence that they had killed uh, a large portion of this is poibotherium it's a type of camel that uh, this dead on relative Archaeotherium would have killed and brought into the same position and cached it and saved their meals for later. And oh, this that's is super a behavior. Smart. Yeah, and this is a behavior you see in bears and leopards um, and some other animals. There's a second photo that I shared. Um, uh, da, da, da. Yeah. Is it. Of a similar. Is it this one? Yes, that's the leopard cache, and so this is a behavior that is known in animals where they would take their kills and kind of bury it a little bit and save it for later, and that's a behavior that we really want to explore with Deodon because 
these were very large animals that would have required a lot of energy to survive. So they would eat pretty much anything. They would eat plants, they would nuts, they would scavenge, and they would save their food for later. Yeah. yeah. And that's something I just find really interesting that we're, we're going to place emphasis on. And from the paleo scientist perspectives, we also loved any species that did these sort of caching behaviors. Well, we often, it can be difficult to figure out what specific, you know, prehistoric creature was the one who created the cache. Yeah. The caches themselves are such a valuable fossil find because yeah. a creature has kind of done the steps necessary to create optimal fossilization conditions <laughs> yeah. for yeah, us. They, they literally just gathered a bunch of individuals and buried them for you. And yeah, really... and then we can find them later, and it's very helpful. Free graveyards. Yeah. We love that. Yeah. Amazing. Uh. That that's super cool that uh, we're taking the time to explore right these not just the things themselves but like what we can infer plausibly about their behavior, uh, and yeah, sounds like using some pretty sophisticated tools. Like I mean, micro uh, teeth microware to infer diet is not, uh, you know, an easy thing to uh, parse in scientific literature. And that's not something that, like, a public is generally going to be aware of as, like, a thing you can even do. So, yeah. I love the yeah. idea that we're, like, really trying to apply pretty recent scholarship here uh, into yeah. these documentaries. Yeah, yeah and no, what I... the t Oh, go ahead. Oh, what I love is... So, I'm not a dentist, but I do think mammal teeth are really fascinating in just how much they can teach you because uh, Scott Foss, he's the main scientific advisor we have for the Intellidons, and he was talking about how younger Intellidont specimens, uh, before they reach full mature age, their first set of teeth are actually sharper and their wear patterns are different from the adults. And for that, you can infer that the younger individuals would have eaten more meat mm -hmm. than the larger adults do. And that makes a lot of sense when you look at how big and heavy the head of Deodon was, that this would be better for, for crushing bone while scavenging or for eating hard plant material. While the younger individuals would probably have been faster and better at hunting. So that's also something we showcase in the film. Because I don't think that's any something anyone is aware of. I've actually had people try to correct me for the information I'm providing because they think, oh, this animal could have only eaten one thing in their entire life. And no, that's just not how animals work. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where modern analogs can be incredibly helpful as well because... Yeah it's very silly to assume, well, you know, these creatures could have only eaten one thing, and then you look at the average black bear in the U.S., and yeah. well, they're eating anything they can find, and there's no reason to assume that was not always true. Um, yeah. The other point I wanted to sort of, sort of bring up while we're on the topic of teeth is, you know, Entelodont and a lot of these other mammal species we're sort of talking about in this time period, uh, they all have daunt in their name, which is just tooth. That's, that's yeah. fair. A significant yeah. portion of mammal paleontology is primarily Based focused on teeth. On teeth. That, so that a, lot a lot of the of holotype specimens are literally just a tooth. You know, yeah, that's and, fair. <laughs> yeah, and things like that is why you have like a bunch of renaming and invalid species because they just get named off of fragmentary teeth and then you realize oh wait someone already described this you gotta change the name back so you yeah. see in some older documentaries they refer to it as dinohyus instead of deodon because of confusion like that yeah, yeah. which is a, a common problem across it, select any across portion of paleontology yeah. <laughs> we i mean problems of the fossil record i mean even in these caches we'll find there's bias towards certain portions of different animals because some stuff is more fragile some stuff gets sort of lost as a body is drugged to a cache or doesn't preserve as well yeah. in sort of one of these flooding events mm -hmm. so there's a lot of weird stuff that can happen names get really complicated sometimes in paleontology we do our best yep uh yeah. you have big fights about it yeah. uh, <laughs> occasionally 
<laughs> yeah, uh, and bias is frustrating because some we wanted to include um, smaller animals to kind of fill out the environment, like birds and reptiles. But most of those that we feature aren't known from the Harrison Formation specifically because of the preservation bias. You don't find very many uh, bird bones just because of the way they preserved where they're these bones were literally trampled on. And that's how they got buried into the ground. So you wouldn't find very many birds or lizards or small animals. So we had to look at formations nearby Nebraska and infer that these animals probably migrated. We would probably see them in Agate as well. Okay. Yeah, definitely. And that's something that also happens. Um, I've done a lot of work with uh, paleobotanists and the oh. preservations that are great for preserving leaves and trees and then bones of creatures that might have lived at the same time and insects yeah. are for wildly different preservation conditions and mm -hmm. so we just may not have those rocks or we may not have them at an equivalent time period and so something i appreciated even in the trailer um and something that's a trend in a lot of paleo art that i don't like is you avoided the whole parking lot and monkey puzzle basically a flat <laughs> dirt ground with yeah. a conifer tree in the background that's super common in paleo art because we just don't have a lot of information in many cases about what the plants would have been and so paleo artists just sort of feature the animal anyway you know yeah, yeah and what i what i also like about um the maya scene is you also most modern plant groups were around so it is a bit easier than the mesozoic to reconstruct the environment because you don't have to figure out, okay, where do these completely extinct plants grow and what would they look like? So it's a bit easier for us on, on our end, but we are trying to make the environment unique as well. We're looking at a lot of um, reference from India, especially. I feel like that is the closest analog to how agate would have looked because it is... There are parts in India where it's a mix of subtropical environments and plains. We're also looking at a bit of Africa for that as well, but with North American grasses and North American trees. I think that's just a very neat look. And if you can pull up some of the images that we yeah. have used for reference. Uh, yeah, let's see if I've got... Uh, I can at least pull up some of the in-trailer shots here too. Uh, yeah. Showcase some yeah. of those examples. Let's see. Uh, looks like that looks like one of our very good reference images uh, in East Africa. Uh, and yeah. Then comparing that to what we see uh, in the trailer in the documentary. Uh, actually, let's if I click back into the early stages <laughs> here. Uh, there was that beautiful landscape shot that is, I think. A, like a really great comparison point uh there versus yeah and if you if you look at this this is kind of a, a combination of the oak savannas you see in america now with the type of climate that was in um that's in um, um sorry it's hard for me to talk right now but it's pretty similar to the climate that's in africa right now but with North American plants sure. and yeah and those animals would fill out kind of similar niches but not really and that goes back to the same I guess uncanny valley feel that I like about um, the, the agate fossil beds where it kind of looks like something you'd see in the modern day but not really and that just really fascinates me and I just love that aesthetic yeah, uh, I think that's super compelling, right? Where it's almost familiar, and then it's just, it's not quite, like, look, you could tell me that this is, uh, I don't know, uh, eastern, like, I don't know, somewhere in Iowa, and I'd believe you, because uh, there's there's woodland spaces in Iowa that look very similar to this yeah. in some of the state parks. Uh, but then it's inhabited with things that are, like, super different and weird, and still give you that like good 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 feeling that the paleo documentaries all do of uh you're seeing something like getting to experience something in a landscape that feels like super plausible super like a modern prairie uh 
but then inhabit it with like fun weird stuff all right yeah. i think that's something yeah. that like i don't know uh walking with dinosaurs does phenomenally prehistoric planet does phenomenally and that we see here uh in forgotten bloodlines is looking like it's being done really well yeah and just for a point yeah. of comparison adam do you still have the uh i get fossil beds page up? yeah yeah i super do can we jump Let's... back to that one for a second uh we can totally do that i'll have to click around randomly until i locate it uh i think it's this one <laughs> i've up about 30 tabs open at this point uh don't worry about it uh is, is yeah, this the one you're looking uh... for <laughs> the one that had the list of all the different creatures. This one. There we go. Yeah. And this is just, this isn't even, like, close to the, the full list. Like, the area was so diverse with, yeah, only only 30. There are a lot of animals, and that's why one of the Kickstarter tiers is you can pledge $500, and you can choose an additional animal to put in because we just can't fit in everything. Yeah. So the reason I wanted to jump back to this page, though, was simply for the comparison of the environments around the animals in each of the pictures here. Yeah. Because um, yeah. it's it's pretty clear that, I mean, these look like a slightly older, you know, representations of these creatures. And this is a good example of that sort of parking lot environment I was talking yeah. about, where they technically drew some brown grass so it's not just the dirt but it's clear that there was a lot of focus put on to reconstructing the animals those animals mm -hmm. look really interesting and the environment they live in is sort of empty and so i really appreciate yeah. in the trailer that that's something you're actively trying to build not just the creatures but the world that they would have inhabited yeah thank you uh, yeah. i want to highlight that's... like the marapas here for looking exactly like uh, the banks of the North Platte today, All right? That river in the background, <laughs> I looks exactly like the North Platte in like semi-arid Great Basin, Northern Colorado, <laughs> and it's like okay, yeah, and okay, you didn't even think about what it looked like twenty million years ago. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, I feel like this you would see a lot of similarities to modern North American ecosystems, but all kind of combined together. And that's what I love because oak savannas do exist in some places. Prairies do exist still, but you combine all of them into one environment. So you get a huge diverse array of species that live there. Yeah. That, uh, Episinosaurus in chat hopefully gave the full mural, which, I mean, showcases it way better. Look at all the animals, yeah. all the animals, all the animals, all the animals. Uh, there's our obligatory tree. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and someone else mentioned uh, the Kickstarter list for animals you can choose. So we haven't written the full list down because there are animals that we don't want to include, like Diceratherium, that is very similar to Minoceros. I don't see the purpose in putting in another animal that is so similar that takes more time and money to create. But if you do want to see a, a larger list, I will get the link. Oh, yeah, right there. I've got yeah. it in chat. Is... Uh, chat is on point with their links, so we have got the options. Uh... Yeah, so these this isn't even the full list that we will provide when we do launch. When the campaign is over, there will be a more comprehensive list that also includes reptiles, amphibians, birds. Um, but this is a good starting point uh, for you to look at and see what types of animals lived here. Oh, is Paleocaster not currently in the documentary then? It is currently in the documentary. Perfect. We included stuff in here that is in the documentary. Um, I can get the list of what's actually in. Amazing. Um, uh, these guys, these guys are super weird, and I love them because they're beavers yeah. that dig like weird burrows. Yeah, oh, the this burrows list is so just. Strange. Yeah, this list includes everything, not just things that aren't included. Fantastic. Ah, oh, what a good. I mean, that's a lot of different species identified. Yeah, and that's why we can't include all of them, but we love to include as many as possible, and that's why this pledge exists because pay us, then we will uh, have enough money to make more animals. You know, that's a that's so... a great great pitch. Uh, you want more weird animals? 
uh, head over to the Kickstarter oh page and help make this happen. The Salamander. I think it's so funny how... So I'm not sure if you're aware, but there was a... I forgot the species and genus name, but... In uh, early Miocene North America, there was a giant, like, seven-foot-long salamander that I mentioned on a Discord chat, and a bunch of people gathered together and raised $500 to include that salamander, and I think that's really awesome. We're, we're getting a picture mean... of the salamander, don't worry. Uh... <laughs> Andreas Matthew, yeah, sorry, I should have pulled it up earlier, but it's huge, and it's become a bit of a meme, and I love that. Why, why is it just... Why is its thing just Matthew? Its species name is Matthew. Probably I named guess... after the person. <laughs> I... yeah, so, no, we're going to find actual references for it beyond just... I, I would go to the um, the, the first image on the, the top left just this... to show the scale of this thing. Yeah, yeah, that is yeah. a seven so... foot long, 2.3 meter yeah, like, it, it's salamander. The same genus as, it's the same genus as modern giant salamanders, just even bigger that's absolutely hilarious we love that uh yeah so does it have a good uh, reconstruction it the... does not yeah okay there aren't any reconstructions of it and that's also something we want to do with agate there are some animals that we are including that straight up have no reconstructions of how and... how the internet Get on this. I mean, obviously you guys are already getting on this. Um, yeah, but we're getting on. That's our... Like, we the internet's the obsession with soft internet. boys uh, and a seven-foot-long huggable giant salamander seems like the ultimate yeah. soft boy that should have been, like, uh, everywhere already. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, the other animals we're including are Cyndiaceris, Megalictus, Peleocastor, uh, Promeri Cachiris, Parahippus, and then this gets into the non-mammals, uh, Bathornis, uh, Paractiornis, uh, Alligator McGruey, which is a tiny uh, dwarf alligator, and Phasmogyps, which was um, inferred to be a type of vulture. In addition to our main cast, which are Deodon, Meropis, Menaceris, Staphinodon, and Stenomylus, which are the animals we have modeled and have revealed already. Amazing. That is so many... Uh... We are pointing, uh, chat is continuing to stand for, uh, Andreas Matthew. Uh, and I'm just saying. Oh, yeah, no, no they, look, they the already merch... raised the money for it. <laughs> they already what? raised the money for, uh, Andreas Matthew, yeah. If, if you want to make absolute bank, here's a free tip for any aspiring entrepreneurs out there. Andreas Matthew body pillows. Oh my god, that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd love to partner with someone, like, sell merch of that. So, uh, right, yeah. we need we need the Carboniferous uh, Millipede and Andreas Matthew as body pillars stat. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, now that the animal is confirmed to be in because you lovely people raised money for it, we're thinking of having a scene where it, uh, Deodon is trying to take a mud bath and this guy spooks him because he's, he's wallowing in the mud and I think that would be pretty fun. What uh, we love. Uh, I need this in my life. So, yeah. you know, uh, when we're talking about like creating compelling characters, I mean, we've only just met him and we would already die from him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where is the merch, Max? <laughs> uh... Give me money, and then I can produce the merch. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, uh, the paleo... Chad is c completely obsessed. I am completely obsessed. You've sold me completely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we love that. Um, so, let's turn uh, briefly away from the excellent... Uh, Excellent things of Andreas Matthew. Um, to a really interesting point uh, that's kind of, we've kind of been circling around uh, in the conversation of that you've said a couple times like you're really interested in um, sort of our current scholarship best guess scientific accuracy when it comes to uh, how we are portraying the environment and how the creature and the creatures uh, and specifically including scenes to showcase. Uh, social behaviors that go beyond just, you know, the material animal itself. Uh, how do you actually go about 
doing that in a creative project, right? Let's get like deep into the weeds here uh, of how do we determine like what is sufficiently accurate um, to be included in a documentary like this? So we do have multiple scientific consultants, which we talk to them about. And what I think someone mentioned earlier, modern analogs, those are something that are really helpful where you uh, infer the ecology of these animals based on the way their bones are shaped and based on the wear on their teeth. And something with Theodon that we are inferring are, I, I have some Im images of that too. You know, the skull has these massive um, tubercles on, on their cheeks. And that is actually uh, a sexually dimorphic trait. Um, female entelodonts have smaller cheeks, and that is something that's also shared in giant forest hogs. And based on that, we can figure out that, you know, they probably had huge scent glands on their face, and that kind of leads into, well, if they had huge scent glands on their face, they're probably using pheromones for communication. And if they're using pheromones for communication, then they might have been a little bit social, even though we haven't found them in herds. That's how we kind of write the story based around a lone Rodeodon that's looking for a mate. And we kind of create the story based on the behavior and we kind of inter interweave them. So we created the story from our, for our characters after we talked to our scientific consultants and figured out what these behaviors could have been and how do we take a, tell a story based around this. Sure. So, so it sounds like at least right from the behavior side, right, we, we're starting with the physical fossil, right? We're starting with the material yeah. evidence that survives. And then from that, we're able to make inferences based on, you know, the latest research, uh, you know, yeah. sexual dimorphism analysis. Yeah, and comparing it to modern animals, what are the trends mm -hmm. with modern animals? If you see something that's sexually dimorphic, then you can look at modern animals to tell how behavior how that's in influences behavior and same thing about the uh, you can find dead on in certain locations that's more associated with forested habitats rather than the more arid plains habitats that you find uh that the bear dogs tend to like and you find uh um the camels and the rhinos in those more plains environments and then you can figure out how to tell a story between uh, which animals go together in the story and how to tell it. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and we do find some, you know, fossil evidence of behavior and interaction as oh, yeah, well. I don't yeah, know you if find... you have any, any specific examples of those. Oh, yeah. Like oh, I should, have, I should have shared uh, <laughs> the images, but uh, Deodon and Atelodons in general have fa facial bitings on them. Most skulls have some sort of wounds created by another intelligent. So we include intraspecific combat and rivalries as part of our story because we have fossil evidence for that, as well as a direct fossil evidence of competition and predation. There are um, tooth marks in Meropis, um, Meropis bones that the only animal that could have made that is from a deodon. So now we know, okay, these animals interacted. This is what the interaction was. How can we take that further? And <laughs> sorry, I'm just reading the chat. <laughs> yep. And tell a story based on that. Ch Chad is very much taking the uh, if not friend, why friend shape approach uh, to yeah. everything in this <laughs> documentary, <laughs> which you yeah. know, uh, fair, extremely friend shaped. Yeah, and I'll see if I can find the, the images somewhere. I should have pulled it up earlier, but um. No, no worries. Yeah, it, yeah. Um, oh, awesome. Um, you, it does sound like there's also some inferences going on. You know, uh, of using, uh, making some guesses of either you know, uh, the paleobotany that doesn't survive in this formation, um, 
and the comparison yeah, kind of there, there are a few seeds them. there are a few um there are a few walnut walnut seeds well, that are found here so apart from oaks walnuts would have been a pretty dominant plant yeah so this is the the meropis arm that had uh, a tooth mark in it yeah and the only thing it, that could fit that is a daodon so we know that it was either uh hunting these animals or it was scavenging their bones either way we can and we show both behaviors just to to be safe um we show scavenging behavior and we show a bit of predation because both of them are equally plausible for this animal to do and as you mentioned bears they can do both yeah so yeah yeah and in this particular case i know sometimes we can tell the difference um you know yeah. we find a bite mark that has then healed over um yeah this one hasn't healed over so it could have right. been and scavenging. in that case it's kind of impossible to tell was it it died because it got bit by a daodon or yeah. was it already dead and got bit by a daodon we don't know yeah. we don't have a way to tell so absolutely i think including both again especially with the analogs for that sort of ecological niche makes perfect yeah. sense yeah and yeah another evidence of behavior we already discussed is the caching behavior you can look yeah. at yeah other modern animals that have caching behavior and what are their reasons for burying their prey well probably they can't get a successful hunt all the time so they need to make sure they have stores so that's another thing that we infer for data on that in the opening scene we imply that they don't win most of their hunts and that for an animal that would have cached their food it may it would make a lot of sense that it's not successful a lot of the time yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, right, these all feel like, you know, at least to my relatively lay perspective, these all feel like super plausible inferences of behavior, and uh, situating the, right, using those behaviors to inform narrative choices, to me, feels yeah. like super duper smart and super duper necessary uh, in this sort of project, in a way that's like really not with the media I'm more familiar with, right, when thinking about uh, either paleo games or historical media uh, or material media set in historical time, right, there's a lot more um, looseness that I see in what yeah. inferences are acceptable uh, while still kind of maintaining the immersion. So it's cool to yeah, see that I sort of, I guess, I'd almost say restrictive, um, but... Uh, I guess a better term is probably constrained. Uh... Yeah, and I think that allows, that encourages more creativity. I think when you can't uh, do whatever you want, then it encourages you to come up with new and, and original stories. And that's that's something that I've always believed, that that's something I love about Paleo Art in general, where you are restricted by what you know, and that ends up with more creative and just fun uh, results in my opinion a follow-up question kind of related to that point um are there any sort of creative decisions that you made that you simply just had to kind of make a choice on because that fit the story best or yes. because it yes. just looked cool because there is no evidence one way or another so we don't really do anything that i guess look well we do things that look cool like the but we do have evidence for it like the the dead on with the scarred face we have evidence of facial scarring but there are story decisions we had to make uh mainly with the Meropis story um because the evidence uh involving dead on in Meropis that exists but as we discussed it is 100 percent. we don't know 100 percent what's going on there we did have to stretch it a little bit and everything we have in there is plausible would it be the most likely situation that would have happened um on everyday occurrence maybe not but for the story we do have to make a few sacrifices where it's well okay this is scientifically plausible but it can only happen under certain circumstances so just like any writing, there are admittedly a few contrivances, 
but we also we always make sure we run it by our scientific consultants and double check a reference material to make sure that it is still within the realm of plausibility and isn't just ignoring any evidence yeah uh, i super love that uh, approach right that's something i'm a big fan of in historical media uh of you know take our evidence and like what's the most interesting most inclusive uh most i guess compelling uh creative choice you can make for the audience you're writing yeah for, right and... uh, for historical media, that gets into a bunch of questions of, like, historical diversity. Uh, but I think even it, for this, with the questions like speciation uh, and what what creatures are present in this world, right, creating something that's vibrant and diverse uh, and visually interesting, even if it's not the, like, strictest, statistically most probable everyday occurrence, right, that to me is a better yeah. choice. Right, because it highlights the range of what's possible in this world. And it's yeah, a choice and... that's made in nature documentaries, too, to oh, be yeah. honest. All the time. Like, you film something like planet Earth, and, you know, they've captured the weird behavior that happened to show up on camera. Yeah, they exactly. make editing choices yeah. to fit a narrative, because you're not just watching a live cam of the ocean. You are still telling a story. So I think yeah. that's something to remember in any kind of documentary is there's always the goal for factualism for you know being as accurate as possible but there are always going to be bits that are fictionalized or are a narrative choice because otherwise yeah, exactly. no one would watch yeah well no and people totally watch trail cams all the time I know, but <laughs> it's a different experience right it, it's yeah all media is packaged to tell a story yeah. or to resonate with an audience yeah. in a certain way. Yeah, and what we're also trying to do with this is in directing choices, we often have to, I guess, make it look worse in the way where we want it to look like a cameraman is just filming these and going, oh shit, I didn't expect that to happen. And there some of our storyboard artists have not um not storyboard our layout artists have created kind of hollywood um scripted cameras that we had to remove and replace with what kind of looks like a cameraman just following the animals and not really sure what's going to happen next and i think a big part of what made walking with dinosaurs so successful is even though it's directed and it's scripted it's filmed as if the camera people recording it don't know what's going to happen, just like in a real nature documentary. Yeah, that that's a super interesting point, uh, because th this project does seem to owe a lot to that specific lineage of, like, paleo documentaries, and understandably yeah. so, right? They are completely for certainly uh, myself and alicia here they're like childhood defining uh but they're also like genre defining and uh yeah you know, the i see that even down to the choice of like nigel for a narrator of having yeah. the uh enthusiastic ever so slightly posh british narrator regardless of what the setting is uh no, and is... we are also <laughs> trying to <laughs> we're also trying to lean into the nostalgia a little bit like a lot of people are very nostalgic for Nigel Marvin and his yeah. Chase by Dinosaurs series and his prehistoric park. Yeah. And we thought for, since one of our main goals of this was, we started writing this before we even knew Prehistoric Planet was happening, was to kind of bring back this sort of genre. And we thought he was a really good choice to kind of bring back and remind people of when these sort of um, paleo documentaries were really big and really popular amazing yeah were there is there anything i'm curious that you're specifically right you look back at those paleo documentaries or even look at Pe prehistoric planet last year and we're like mm, you know these are creative decisions we like specifically disagree with and want to i guess comment on and present an alternative to besides you know mesozoic supremacy yeah so i think Walking with Beasts, I really love that, and I think the biggest inspiration for us was probably the Paraceratherium episode, where 
you, you will, once you watch the final film, you'll probably see some similarities to that story and our Meropis. Um, but some creative choices that we disagree with are obviously in appearance. We feel like the Intellidots in that episode are very just kind of gross and gremlin looking. And even though they are trying to be as scientifically accurate as possible, there are still some tropes in there, which to be fair, they kind of created those tropes, <laughs> um, but they've become tropes. And I feel like the directing choice in that specific episode is really good. As for things that I disagree with, something that Prehistoric Planet does that I don't love is they lean too hard almost and this is something the first few episodes of walking with dinosaurs did too in my opinion where they got away from the storytelling aspect and moved too far into just showing animals going about their day and i feel like you need a balance because otherwise it gets a little boring like i was disappointed in prehistoric planet when in the freshwater episode the t-rex was bleeding in the water and oh this is a freshwater episode i bet a crocodile is going to come in and lash out at him or oh what, what's going to happen but instead the action just cuts short and oh it's totally fine it's just another t-rex it's a mate so something we want to do with our documentary which is something i feel like uh walking with walking with beasts specifically does really well is set up tension and follow through with that tension I feel like something Prehistoric Park does, not Park, Prehistoric Planet does, is it's trying too hard to um, counteract Jurassic Park to the point where um, any interesting animal behaviors that may be considered violent or exciting in any way are kind of toned down. And something we're trying to do in our documentary is to show that, hey, we have evidence of these animal fights, we have evidence of injuries and um, diseases that we're also going to show. Yeah, not just that, um, it, it's somewhere, I don't feel like finding it right now, showing the day of dawn with um, the facial bite marks yeah. and the scar and the scars on the bones. And that's something that prehistoric planet, I feel like, ignores. I feel like it makes everything too clean. Yeah. Um, in some ways, that's a case where I feel like Prehistoric Planet owes, like, a lot of specific DNA to planet Earth. Uh, yeah. And it's sort of very... Look at how beautiful it all is approach to presenting the modern natural world. So it's yeah, interesting to show, yeah. see those, like, things intertwining and in some cases, right, starting to diverge into, like, different documentary trends. Yeah, and we show that, too, like the sense of awe and wonder but i also think part of that that makes it beautiful to me is that every animal has their own story and that can be shown through blood and, and through I, w I don't want to say the word violence because it's not gratuitous it's not trying to be scary or anything and that was a trend in some documentaries um like monsters resurrected that tried too hard to make it too scary and yeah. epic. <laughs> Quote unquote and, the grit. <laughs> yeah. And that's something I feel like the first walking with dinosaurs had a bit of that problem in my opinion too, where the first few episodes of the first series was a bit more laid back, a bit more toned down, but then once they got into walking with beasts, they found a good footing where they they knew when to have action and when to have have peace so that's i'd say our biggest inspiration for the kind of tone we're going for yeah i feel like it's the best blend of um moods which that's how nature is in reality god i, I love scrolling through this list you can actually s s see that trend happening like in in action just by looking at this list oh, yeah right you get just, just these ones these ones the these posters, ones like we hit yeah, that like mid-2000s, and it just... Yeah. 
Like oh, right around right after Walking Dead Monsters, it kind of turns into Jurassic Fight Club. Fight Tarver Club. Swiss, the mightiest ever. Uh -huh. and, yeah. Monsters resurrected. Clash of the Dinosaurs with the blood splatter on the poster. Cla yeah, March of the Dinosaurs being you... a bit weird, like an anomaly in there. Dinosaur revolution, power yeah, to the like primal. Got yeah. Discovery Channel, why are you like this? <laughs> yeah, and as also, I moving... just... Just the quality of the reconstructions just goes so downhill in the late 2000s, early 2010s. I have no idea why. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and yeah, I think it is ironic how the first one to come out is was still the best one for a while. And now that we're in the 2020s, things are starting to get back on track with the prehistoric planet. And that's why I think it's the new Walking with Dinosaurs. It's doing the same thing the first Walking with Dinosaurs series did, where it saw Jurassic Park and it's like, okay, let's flip that on its head. Yeah. Ah, uh, we we love that. And I'm glad I'm glad that right, something that stood out to me in this interview is just the amount of care we're taking to uh almost like sidestep Jurassic Park entirely, uh, right? Yeah, like we're, it... we're existing in the genre that's a response to it, but, like, one of the cool things about working with the Miocene instead of, you know, uh, Mesozoic supremacy, uh, is that we actually operate in, like, a totally different, I guess, reconstructive space, where yeah, a totally and... different set of behaviors are possible, and that's super yeah, cool. And what I love, what I love about it is... Even though agate fossil beds is very well known, there's a lot of specimens from there, we have a good understanding of its ecology, there isn't a lot of art of it. And that Jay Maturns piece that is shared everywhere, I, I love it, but that's decades old by this point. Yeah. And we are often reconstructing animals that have little to no representation at all. So we have no tropes we have to worry about subverting we aren't trying to be different in that way and i think it's really freeing to have not complete freedom because you know we have to stick the science but freedom in we aren't bound by what people have done before us and i think that's really fun yeah uh, I, th I think that's super cool, and I'm super excited to see what you get to do with that. So, I think we are unfortunately yeah. coming up on the end of our available time for this conversation, but I do want to uh, kind of close with a question of, like, ideal circumstances, right? What do you hope the uh, impact of Forgotten Bloodlines is, and, like, what are you hoping to accomplish here with uh, Forgotten Bloodlines, I get? Yeah, what I'm hoping the impact is, is we want to show people a new side to prehistory where some people are aware that Intelodonts and Calcathiers and all that exists, but it's never been put on screen with the same care that uh, a lot of dinosaurs have. And my goal is to just get more people interested in it and create a new group of people who are really fascinated by this time in Earth's history in the same way I am. And I'm hopeful that if the Agate episodes are successful, we can focus on other fossil formations from different time periods with the same goal. Like, the, the title Forgotten Bloodlines comes from these are lineages of animals that are both forgotten to time, but also forgotten within just culture in general, and we want to shine a light on that. So yeah. my my optimistic end result is if this is successful, we will see more popularity for these animals in general and people more willing to take risks when depicting prehistory. Amazing. I think that's a super noble goal and one we wholeheartedly believe. So uh, I am pulled over to the Kickstarter page, though irritatingly... Um, it's not letting me scroll sideways the way I want uh, to look at these. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, we have a bunch of Kickstarter tiers, uh, right? So if you are interested in supporting this, right, you get rewards starting as little as, little as $7, uh, but going all the way up, you get some really cool stuff, right? Uh, the wallpapers of these reconstructions look so fun. Uh, the art books... 
physical prints. Ah, oh, we love that. Uh, bonus Easter eggs. And we already talked about, right, the, uh, the 500, the additional bonus animals at that $500 yeah. tier. So there's so much, so much cool stuff here. Uh, you can almost see it here, but right. We can just see, uh, so much, um, in like this, uh, Kickstarter of just what is possible and so many cool options there are. Yeah, and another reward that I think is overlooked, but I'm also recommending a bit, is yeah. Early Access the soundtrack. You guys haven't heard the soundtrack. It is amazing. We got Sarah Class to do it. She was she is a composer for, like, over 30-something BBC documentaries. You've oh. probably heard her music before. She's currently... She's commissioned by the upcoming... Uh, Prince Charles for his coronation, she's doing the music for that, and I think that's a huge flex to say the king commissioned me. So commission uh, commission would, your composer. Uh yeah, commission my composer. My composer worked for the for the king. And <laughs> I think if that you should definitely uh consider that and any higher award tiers you'll get that as well. But um, if you've amazing. watched the trailer, those are snippets of her music. And I think it carries the themes of the animals really well, and I'm excited for you to hear uh, it. The digital art books of Field Guide, oh, fantastic. Yeah. Absolutely will, incredible. Yeah. The art book will include a bunch of concept art we did for it. We will show process work for creating the animals, and yeah, in a, in a field guide kind of style where we share information about it. It also doubles as, if you've ever read the Walking with Dinosaurs evidence book, it's similar to that as well where it's a mix of an art book, and we explain all of our choices behind the reconstructions and storytelling. Absolutely Fantastic. incredible. Uh, I wish you the best of luck with this. Uh, I'll certainly be keeping an eye on this project. And by the way, you just crossed 54,000 uh, during oh, this awesome. stream. So 72% of the way yeah. funded. So if you are interested, uh, chat, once again, do head over here uh, to that Kickstarter page and consider supporting this project because I think it's incredibly worthwhile. And I mean, doing something that doesn't currently exist in the paleo documentary space. And we love things that do things that haven't been done before. Yeah. All right. So. Thank you so much, uh, Max and Alicia, for uh, joining me for this conversation. Like, it's been an absolute delight to talk with you both and get to talk about a period that is, you know, uh, a mere 20, just shy of 20 million years before the period I know anything about. So this has been super informative for me and super fun. Yeah, I had a lot of fun too. Yeah. yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, so... Uh, there are 13 days left in the Kickstarter for Forgotten Bloodlines I get. So, again, if you want that, it is currently in Kickstarter for the pilot episode. Uh, so the first third of the project uh, to be able to ship that to more major studios uh, and uh, get more support for the rest of the project. Thank you everyone who tuned in as well. Uh, if you liked this sort of stuff on my end, I do stream a wide variety of historical content, so we'll hopefully see you all in future streams uh, for that, for not a ton of paleo stuff in the near future, but hopefully in the not too distant future, uh, more paleo games, more of that. But yes, um, once again, uh, Forgotten Bloodlines I Get is uh, about Miocene, Nebraska, Kickstarter documentary. Uh, so head over there, support it, uh, and thank you both once again. Uh, so yeah, that does it for us here uh, at Ludo History. So until next time we see you, uh, thank you all, and have a good rest of your night. All right, bye-bye.